up next, we have Brian Lucas. Uh, Brian's a senior staff engineer at Optimizely, and before that, he was a CTO at Credible and Hoopla, and the lead architect at Slimbox. I'm Brian Lucas. I'll just go through this. Um, I've given this talk, or a variation of this, in a few different forms. I adapted this for the audience here, because I know a lot of people here are highly familiar with a lot of the best practices. Um, I'm going to talk about what we do at Optimizely. Um, if you don't know Optimizely, or actually I'll start with me, uh, senior staff, a lot of delivery and billing team uh, focus that I've had in the last several years. I helped create a company called Credible, which IPO'd in 2017, uh, and then I was lead architect at Sling TV and some things like that. Um, so about Optimizely, we work with the largest companies in the world. Uh, we provide experimentation, feature flagging, A-B testing. We started way back when uh, with a A-B testing platform. You just go put in a visual interface. You could drop it in on your own website, change a button, make something blue or green. It was super cool. Marketing teams no longer had to talk to their engineers to change a button. Um, now we've gone into every, S every client SDK, uh, as well as front end, back end, uh, mobile, Apple TV, pretty much anything. I don't know. That's a good. It could. I don't know if we actually have drones that. That'd be interesting. But um, I'll follow up on that. I'll check. Um, the lar we have the largest customers in the world. The only ones that are not Optimizely um, are some of the ones that might have built their own experimentation platform. Um, you probably have a couple ideas who they are. So Optimizely actually came out of Google, spun out of there. Um, there was some uh, experiments going on, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, but I think it should be fun. So a couple things about what we do and what we've learned. Um, and then I'll just talk about just how we run our programs and how we build things at scale. So successful software companies, I'm going to talk about that. They all have some common traits. Uh, work in high velocity, high levels of quality, and of course, high de <laughs> highly productive developers, <laughs> or high developers. But there's a few things slowing you down on that. So as software complexity grows, so do all the components necessary to support it. Safeguards, slowdown, risk, QA team, you know, extensive test cases, all of that slows you down a lot. So this can lead to disintegration. This can actually cause a lot more velocity slowdown than you ever anticipated, especially as your surface area grows. So things like cumbersome build processes, snowflake builds, like, oh, I stood up a server a long time ago and I don't remember how to clone it, so let's go waste a week researching that and I hope I've got the SSH key to get into it. Um, expensive validation cycles, all of that stuff takes far too long if you're not investing in the time and effort to build it. So a lot of risks at this. Uncaught bugs, like if you've got a massive application or a set of applications, could you cover every reasonable surface? Probably not. Does a customer want this? Anyhow, the way we get around it is through faster delivery. So kind of like some of the other speakers here have talked about small change sets or what you're after. But that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So for us, we want to improve velocity, we want to increase velocity, but we want to do that in a way that helps de-risk the product and the platform. So when you release with faster cycles, you're actually doing more with less. You can cover a lot more ground and reduce your, reduce your risk to your customer and your engineering group by moving faster, shipping quicker, and having less surface area to worry about. So for us, I'm going to talk about three, focus on three areas. The first is um, maybe antithetical to what some people here uh, are expecting, but reducing your QA. 
and the dependencies on it, automating your feedback loops, and then embracing and adopting experimentation. We'll talk about a few of those things I'm, I want to let everyone kind of get down to the rest of the night, so I'm not going to keep you for all night here, but I'll just walk through a couple of these things real quick. 50% um, of a software engineer's time is spent fixing bugs. This is probably not the case when you're just starting out because you don't really have any code. So if you're a startup and you're a two-person startup, this might not apply to you because you just are building everything from scratch day in, day out. Once you reach a certain size and scale, a lot more of your time gets caught up fixing bugs, fixing issues. So most of these components, as everyone knows, work well enough in isolation, but what happens when we throw it all together? No one plays nice. They all can't share the same ball in the sandbox. No one's happy. So I want to talk a little bit uh, about some of the issues we had. This was a chart <clears throat> from our side, high severity bugs. So everyone knows like Sev0, Sev1, you know, code red, sky falls kind of thing, all that terrible stuff. We had a lot of those initially. Um, fortunately, we were all able to recover from them relatively quickly, but we started noticing themes on this, and it was just that we weren't doing enough like regression testing. So how do, what, what does that mean? Well, we weren't prioritizing some of the heavy lifting that we should have been doing. What that meant was when you actually have to do it right, it takes a lot of time. It, like, you got to spend a ton of time and effort. And when you're a startup, you don't always have the luxury of that time. So we know this model. Throw it over the old fence. Um, don't do this, but if your company does, hopefully you can uh, take some of these things and stop the teams from doing that and throwing things over the fence because uh, that doesn't benefit anyone. So we're all inclined initially towards this. Um, the good old pyramid, our development effort, when it goes like that, oops, when it looks like that, um, manifests in a ton of development effort that is down on the bottom side and very minimal on the top. So we're kind of like, oh, well, if I just manually QA everything, I have very little development effort on the engineer side, but a lot more on the QA side. So what we sh these delays really add up when it's time to validate. So if you're doing one deployment or one commit and check in a day, maybe you have this time. But when you're running 20,000 tests per commit like Optimizely does or more, um, we don't have that. We, we can't actually uh, engage and leverage this much time in development. We need to figure out a way to shift that. So groups that don't prioritize this end up losing their momentum instead of conserving it. So if anyone knows the term shift left on QA, um, then you already know what I'm this next slide, if you don't, real easy to visualize what that means. Let's say this is their normal development cycle. So you've got your design, build, deploy, QA, and fix. And finally, you release. And this takes, I don't know, on average, maybe two weeks for a normal company. Now, if you shift left on your QA, you actually are shifting that QA component left you get a little more, you get a little less concerned about getting it perfect, but you realize, oh, I can do a thing called a hot fix. So what this lets you do is speed up that cycle drastically and cut down your release cycle a lot quicker. So you can do this whole process in one to three days. Some groups actually do it on like every commit or multiple times per day. We do it. We actually did it multiple times per day. We've shifted a little bit less now to about the one to three days um, per production release, but we were going out multiple times per day. So when you reduce that effort, or re you reduce the dependency on QA, um, it actually starts to look a lot nicer. So in validation, in theory, your validation effort 
starts to kind of map like this, and I put in theory or theoretically because there's probably still a little bit more time and effort that you have to spend on it. So, one other thing that we do, which is also kind of interesting, is to reduce our QA effort, we actually crowdsource it to all engineers. So we collect all commits and all JIRA tickets and everything else that goes out with that particular release, and this could be on a daily basis. We just have a nice little spreadsheet that says, hey, your, your commit has been pushed out to everyone else in a nice little integration environment. Have you validated it? So what does that look like? Well, if they do validate it, they're owning and they're taking kind of ownership that they have tested it. And if they haven't, they can't really say, oh, well, we should have caught that or QA should have caught that. The engineer's responsibility was to catch that and actually figure out, oh, we need to push a quick fix before that hits customers. Works pretty well because it saves everyone's sanity. You don't have one group testing 100 commits. You have one engineer testing their one commit who knows the best way to do that. And we also have some basic UAT that goes out as well. You also want to keep that test to noise, test signal to noise ratio high. So especially when you have thousands and thousands of tests, those things can get really brittle and break pretty easily. So you want to mitigate that real quickly. You want to jump in, disable them. Like it's probably better if a test all of a sudden starts to fail to stop everything and investigate. But if a test is passing periodically, it's better to disable it unblock all your engineers, and then go back in, ticket it, and come back later. So I'm, gonna, I'm still going to keep going through the, some of these things. This is how, that's how uh, Facebook does it. They have a thing called Test Warden. Um, when you keep your test signal to noise ratio, you need to visualize and collect metrics on how everything is performing. We keep a hourly or a minute by minute count of what tests are failing versus which ones are not are passing and we can tell you, hey, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis, this is how many tests failed so you know, oh, this one's probably not in a good state. So it tells us where to focus, which one to go dig into. <coughs> so next part I want to talk about is automating your loops. Uh, feedback loops are really what are the secret part of this whole process. If you don't have that feedback cycle, you're actually not able to leverage and grow at scale because there's some human element involved. So this is what your release strategy could or should look like. Um, to boil it all down, like really just deploying to a stable integration environment with everyone else's changes and optionally going out to production after you do a basic sanity check or if you're confident enough with your large body of tests, you can just go out straight to production. So when you embrace continuous everything, that's helping build out those feedback loops, but I'm gonna dig into what some real life examples are because this part is probably a little bit overused, like continuous integration, delivery, deployment, and those all, people I think have a pretty good idea of what they mean, but let's go into some examples of what that looks like. So when you get everything automated, much fewer surprises because you know um, whether something passed or failed right away. You're not going back and checking on your PR later. You're not going back and confirming if something's looking good or not. I um, want to talk about uh, one other part of this whole process, which is snowflake environments. So uh, Martin Fowler a well-respected uh, software author, uh, talks about Snowflake environments, and this is another major part of building and improving your feedback cycles. Um, everything that you build out and you test against needs to be identical and apples to apples to the next run. Um, if you aren't doing that and you're not building out your infrastructure in a version-controlled way, then you're not actually able to deterministically say, I'm confident that this problem that did exist here was not also present elsewhere. It's not because of some other 
uh, extenuating factor. So one way you avoid this or one way you implement and avoid uh, snowflake environments is very basic things. So you've got, uh, you're, you're implementing Jenkins file, Travis files, your circle CI code build. We use actually all of those. Docker file, Terraform, Kubernetes manifest. Um, if you're building things and you want to do it locally, you can use these immutable build tools called Basil. Um, that one's out of, uh, it's Blaze internally at Google, and I think the open source one is Basil. So all those things can let you build both how it would be on your desktop or on your CI environment and be confident in the outcome. Feedback loops help you drive this continuous, constant improvement. This is just kind of like a high level visualization of how build health is. You can see there's been a couple misses here. Too much data to really go into on this, but this is how we visualize it and give us like a quick check of the day on how we're doing. Um, the other way that you can do some of these things is keep kind of like an exec dashboard. Here's how the best performing and worst performing tests are. We have a simple link called go slash flaky, which says, oh, how is, you know, this test failed for me. I wonder if it's on this flaky manifest file. Well, let's go check. And this tells you how long something takes to run. You can drill into it, get more information on when it first started failing. All of that is only possible because we collect metrics on every single run, every single job, and every single like individual test pass and fail, and it, the, literally tens of thousands per single commit, it's all aggregated, rounded up, and then you can go with high precision, dig back into like, oh, this started two weeks ago. Well, looks like I gotta go look at commits from two weeks ago. Um, here's an example of how you can do something kind of neat within GitHub. Just build a nice GitHub and Slack bot. So hey, I'm gonna go create a pull request. Why don't you wire up a nice little Slack message bot that tells you when you're doing that. So GitHub makes it super easy. They have webhooks, fire that off. You can build something in Node, Python, whatever. Here's us, uh, we're, we've got one that just notifies you when something's off to the races, tells you if it passed or failed. If it failed, it gives you the link, gives you the video, gives you the JUnit output, and you can go dig into it further. So, I'm gonna kinda skip through a few more of these, but that part that I showed you where you're, op you're automating and outsourcing the information for all release engineers, or sorry, all of your standard software engineers to validate your release, we just collect this information from GitHub on pull requests. We say, what are all the commits? Who's the author behind that commit? Do they have a JIRA ticket linked? And then that lets us do this really cool thing here where we take their test case, we take all these summary and information, oops, and we can just turn that straight into that nice little spreadsheet that I showed you. All oh, visualizations, there we go, yeah. So this thing is exactly what we can just send out and say that this is what's coming out in the release. So all of that stuff makes it super easy for our TSEs, our salespeople, everyone else to know, oh, this is what's released to customers or this bug that a customer had reported is now closed. You can tell them it's gonna be fixed on tomorrow's release just because we scraped that data. So, Couple uh, little specific things that might be interesting. Prioritizing that framework is what's crucial here. So injecting sanity into your end-to-end -end tests. Um, writing flaky tests, as everyone knows, if you're running and building things on browser stack, um, browser stack is the, the uh, platform and kind of the infrastructure, but whatever you put into that is up to you. So it's very easy to make those things not work in a reliable way because uh, you're subject to all of these like external uh, network externalities and all these other additional pieces that all have to work harmoniously. Super easy to make those flaky. However, um, if you ever, it, um, if you're gonna go build something within browser stack, one very easy way, and I urge you um, to implement this pattern for your own Selenium test. 
The built-in selenium implicit weight mechanism does not work very well. Um, highly unreliable, if you only fire that off and wait 15, 20 seconds or whatever the case is, how often do you see the uh, reliability come into question? It's probably pretty often. There's a simple way around this. You implement a polling model which says, I'm only gonna wait one or two seconds, I'm gonna fail, but I'm gonna keep retrying that until the, uh, op the operation, whether I'm checking for a DOM, whether I'm checking for CSS, XPath, trying to traverse some tree, all of those things are very easy to fix and correct and make a much more reliable framework if you implement polling. So just a that was basic example right there, like we, we just have a retry block and you can just implement retry, you make your own wrapper around that people um, are interested in talking about that more, happy to do so. So um, lack of clarity on where something broke, again, kind of frustrating, especially for long-winded tests. Make sure that you have assertions on every single step, including just like basic setup, tear down, things like that. Um, also, I think everyone here is probably on the same page, but don't use like baby's first test framework kind of thing or make your own. Use one of the ones that are out there. Um, we built our own, but we built it on top of behave, behaving, and a couple other things, and it works extraordinarily well for us. But don't, you know, go write browser test.py and start, you know, using that to power the company's test infrastructure. Use one, please use one of the nice uh, frameworks that are out there and then just build on top of that. So uh, last thing that I want to talk about is how we adopt experimentation and how you can do some of the same things to do more with less. So it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, if the, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiments, it's wrong. So famous theoretical physicist said this, Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner, very much a believer of experiments looking at the data. So talk about quickly a couple examples of well-known companies, how they do some experimentation. So Google, um, I apologize for this screen because on a bigger one it's a little easier to see, so I'm just going to kind of point at it. These are two almost identical images. Um, probably a little hard to see what the difference is, but this is an actual experiment that was run. Um, there's only one small difference, and it's like the notorious pixel perfect kind of thing. Yeah, it's right there. So they actually ran an experiment to see if people clicked on the plus, like they measure it based on an engagement level. Do people click on the plus more if it has a couple extra pixels or not? Um, they ran 9,800 different types of experiments alone in 2016. So now, this is what it looks like. Uh, if you search for something like IBM, all of their little experiments actually let you wind up with all of this data because they did painstaking one by one experiments to say this is all the information people wanted, this is what we're gonna show them. Let's talk about a couple others, so Facebook. Um, at any point in time, there isn't just one version, there's probably 10,000. So they're also a big believer of experimentation. So this was a, uh, it might be a little tough to see this, this was a voting ask or kind of a voting outreach slide. So they had two asks, one was, or two ways of presenting voting and making people aware on their News, news feed, one was informational and one was social. Um, the informational one was just, hey, there's something going on, we wanna tell you about it, go out and vote. The social one was, hey, there's something going on, we want you to go out and vote, here's all your friends and all your people that also did it. So they did an experiment, because they weren't sure. So which one probably won? Probably the one that looped, that like provided a little bit of peer pressure, that's right. So. The social message, the social message one 
So now, if you see like future voting uh, outreach things, you'll see something where your, your friends also voted. Go be a part of that. So how do you perform software testing on experiments? Um, this is not, it, this is kind of high level or maybe uh, actually low level. Um, and this is just like a stanza or like a BDD Gherkin feature. Um, it's a little hard to test experiments because by nature they're potentially non-deterministic. Um, they are prone to variations. So make sure you, if you're ever gonna take this step and embed or start working on experiments like this, um, you want to be able to define what those expected conditions are and then walk through each permutation. I think, uh, I think in, the, in Gherkin, this is called a scenario, um, but you're basically creating the table structure. You walk, you're defining each of the expected inputs, the output, and what it should be, and you can actually walk through your test scenarios like that. So experimentation is certainly not just for marketing teams anymore. Um, we'll talk about how you can also shift your own development process left. So the design, build, launch process. Uh, this is basically how you might have released way back when. Um, might have gone out and said, I hope I got everything right. But that's no longer something you have to do. There's a much easier way to de-risk that whole process. Um, and that's just by creating a simple deploy, deploy flag, which allows you to experiment and iterate. And the way you do that is through some very simple, straightforward tools that now start to get embedded on your back end or your front end, um, but it's up to you. One of the ways that you can do that is called feature flags. So kind of think of this like the old audio, uh, you know, switchboard kind of things with all the flags up and down. Um, there's a cool one over there. You can go check it out later. But um, here's one that's open source. Um, it's called Bullet Train. They have a nice way of like just GUI turning things on or off. Um, there's another one from Dropbox, Storm Crow. So very simple. Uh, the Dropbox was a very big kind of believer in turning things on or off without doing a code release. So it's a pretty straightforward way to do this. Uh, oop. It's a straightforward way to do it. You just do an if else. Like if flag equals X, do this. If flag equals Y, do this. Um, and that could be on or off. It could be like a percent, could be a number, something, you know, you just basically are doing code paths. Um, feature rollouts are almost identical to feature flags, except you can gradually phase them in. So it, whereas the feature flag is like binary or Boolean on or off for everyone, the rollout lets you say, oh, well, only for mobile or only for 1% or 10%. Am I going to turn this on? So like your mobile people might see this for the most part, and then some people will be um, seeing the old experience, which is great. The reason that's great is because it de-risks a massive amount of problems that you might have on your hands. Um, kind of like maybe the GoodRx example, if you rolled this out to 100% of your users, you're going to lose thousands of dollars. But if you rolled this out to 1% of your users and you found a bug, maybe you've only lost $100. That's probably a lot better. So uh, some of the ways that large companies implement this in practice, which is the kind of rollouts, the feature flagging, and so forth, um, there's a kind of an abstract idea called traffic splitting in canary builds. So, a lot of modern CI tooling allows you to do this, but um, pretty useful for saying only route 1% here, and I'm gonna see if it passes or fails. I'm gonna see if there's any sentry log errors or something that um, I should be concerned with before I ramp it up and turn up the dial all the way to everyone. So traffic splitting within Facebook was something very rudimentary. It was, hey, for if you have a Facebook employee email address, then you're going to go to www.latest.facebook.com. Anyone else went to like production 
you know, more, a little more stable, probably like had been out one day or something like that. Um, but now, there's a much more advanced and sophisticated algorithm that does that. So they do something exactly like I just described, gradually ramp up to 1%, bake that, see if that works. Things look good, let's go out to 5%, 10%, 50%, 100%. Uh, feature flagging automated testing could be a little tricky. So why is this a challenge? Well, there's non-obvious problems, so potential non-determinism during these test runs. Um, you can turn things on or off. Like, the great thing about it is what I just said at the beginning. You don't have to do a code deploy, but guess what? If you're somehow building in code on your, on your pipeline or in your back end, and you change part of that code or, ch you, sorry, you change uh, a feature flag, now all of a sudden that test might potentially break or change out from under you. The behavior could be completely different. There's a very simple solution. You just uh, check in your test feature flag file into your version controlled system and read from that during test runs. So you're, uh, when you're running automated tests, it detects a test runner, it says, oh, I'm just gonna use the feature flag file that's checked into our version control system, and anywhere else, maybe I pull from the cloud when it's on production. Uh, kind of last few examples here about how this works. De-risk critical new features or changes is a great way you can do this. Um, for our example, we compute up to about a trillion event, we actually compute about a trillion events per month, um, trillion data points or just simple log messages that come into our back end. Um, that's very expensive and it's 10 billion plus per day. Um, sometimes, sometimes 100 or 50, 50 to 100 billion on very busy days like a Black Friday, or sorry, like a Cyber Monday, Black Friday kind of thing, or a voting day. Um, so we wanted to try out a few different paths at scale. We didn't know the best way to do that. So what we did is we implemented two open source projects or applications and turned them both on and routed traffic to both of them in a split. That gave us all the metrics at scale, but it also let us turn one on or off, depending on if we found a critical problem while we we're ramping this up. So very critical to make sure you collect all those results and you can visualize and just see who's the winner out of this. Um, same kind of just more examples. We saw that there was a less performant version here, negative 3.65, monitored the results, and then um, got our winner. Last kind of cool idea that you might want to do with feature flags, if you have a risky code a piece of JavaScript or some embedded thing that could break on you or it goes down, you're kind of in big trouble. Like imagine if you had I don't know, Optimizely or Google Analytics or something in your, uh, in the top of your uh, HTML document under your, like a blocking script tag. If that goes down, you might be in trouble. If you can turn that off without a code release, uh, you can immediately wait for that problem to go away or you can just leave it permanently disabled. So that is one of the things we do. We've had some problems with third party vendors, and there's so many of them now in the cloud landscape that um, you're bound to run into this where one of them has downtime, and it's gonna stop or it's gonna force your website not to load. So good idea to be able to quickly turn those on or off. Um, just a quote, I'm gonna kinda ramp, ramp up here, or wrap up. So. To reiterate, uh, feature flags, experimentation, all those things kind of overlap and play nice together. Um, this is really important for developers to move forward uh, and iterate quickly and it allows you to de-risk uh, a lot of crucial elements. So don't shift left on both your QA and experimentation, lets you do things faster. Um, solid foundation of all those tests are critical don't skimp on the frameworks. Don't be afraid to disable badly performing tests. Um, and don't let feature development take priority over core tech debt, core uh, 
test suite development, and core framework development. Uh, those common frameworks that you might want to build out provide large dividends or pay out large dividends down the road. So also consider making some form of experimentation a foundation. It's going to let you move quicker, de-risk, don't worry about if you got it perfect the first go round because you can always turn it off and fix later. So um, our friend always had some good thoughts here at the end. He said, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. So, I don't know. That was probably a bad Dos Equis guy. Um, anyhow, so we have a product for free. So Optimizely um, is generally not synonymous with inexpensive, but our feature flagging product, which is just now an early beta, we haven't even announced it, but I'm letting people here know, um, is free and you can start ramping up and using it right now. No payment, but of course it's our Trojan horse to <laughs> let you use cool things above and beyond that later, but optimize.com slash rollouts. So. Any, any questions, any uh, thing I can talk about? Uh, generally speaking, it's the customers, <laughs> or, or it's uh, sometimes your QA team that will report those back. But hopefully, you're catching those as often as you can before people find them. Yes? Um, you said automate everything. How practical it is to automate everything? Um, good question. It's an aspirational goal more than a, uh, I think, a hard and fast rule. But with a, a really good way to think about it is um, as much of the building blocks that provide and pay out dividends for everyone is what you should focus on initially. Never, you'll never get the 100% automated test coverage, and that's pointless because then you're checking, like, you know, getter and setter types of things, and that doesn't pay out too well. But you get, you start to get into what pay, what gives me the best bang for the buck. And we, act, um, as a quick aside, we were for a long time very Jenkins heavy, and we've just I think we've gotten so we have thousands of jobs, or we had thousands of jobs that were like defined and any developer could do that. Um, we just decided we didn't, we, that wasn't our core competency for things like that. So we wanted to automate all of the systems, but we wanted to do that for someone who could do it better than us. And when you can send that out or think of, um, I, I can either focus our developer time and effort on doing this, or we can automate and have someone else do it better for us, that's where we choose to spend our investment. Yes, so I have two questions. Um, regarding the feature rollout, what's the feedback process? So let's say you're at 1%, 5%. What's the feedback, or what mechanism to capture the feedback to say something you're working on? Um, well, because this is entirely dependent on a feedback loop that the developer will create, you have two ways of doing it. Um, the first is there's an automated rollout or an automated gradual thing that you can think of it like autopilot mode, like if you, or a dead man switch, right? If you don't stop it, it's just gonna continue to ramp up slowly. The other way, though, is um, through doing it with APIs and saying, I'm going to set this variation initially to 1%. And depending on how you're collecting that, you're checking for your baseline of like 500 errors or you know, maybe I was reporting JavaScript errors or I had a baseline. If that doesn't deviate or that no longer spikes when the 1% of traffic that I'm monitoring um, has been rolled out, then I'm gonna tweak, then I'm gonna set my API to make the variation, in this case the variation is like the new version of code, 2% and just gradually do that. You have a mechanism or most of the time you'll have a mechanism to detect 
when that when a spike like a 500 error on your back end or a JavaScript error is emitted, you're going to capture that and that'll be a eject switch or like an emergency abort. You'll have to go and dig into that. Maybe it's a non-issue, maybe it's unrelated, and then you stop or you'll allow it to keep proceeding. But it's ultimately up to the developer to keep that process. So, so it's, but in situations it's possible that everything is running at 200, but uh, somebody cannot check out because of some other reason. Absolutely. So, you don't, I think what's most critical is you need to have a little bit of like bake time or you don't want to just probably go out within five minutes and say everything's perfect. You leave it for maybe 12 hours, maybe six hours, depending on how aggressive you are. If you don't have any critical bugs within that, it's a pretty good signal that there's nothing obvious or nothing immediate show stopping. But um, if you do get those bugs, the teams are generally conditioned to say, oh, we have a way of determining if they were on the new version or the old version, and which one was it? Maybe this is critical, maybe we should stop. And then secondly, uh, in traditional rigid <coughs> systems wherein your databases dictate you know, a lot of how things work, um, how do you do feature rollouts? Because if there's database changes that are required, how do you do that? <laughs> Um, great, great question, and it's bit us before. Um, the shortest answer, and I don't know of a better way to do this, but it works for us. Um, anything that will mutate a database in the form of a migration, like dropping a column, like oh, let's use you know like a relational database as an example. The most expensive and the table locking type of operations that you'd want to avoid at all costs are things that drop um, or update a column type or you know, whatever in some kind of migration. I think, <coughs> I think adding a column is probably fine. Um, but any of those things that require some mutation like that, you want to do it a scheduled window or rollout. And sometimes we've had to like say, oh, you have to do it at Sunday morning 6 a.m. or something. Um, but oftentimes the simplest way is to make any schema changes backwards compatible and that means something that needs to modify it usually writes to a new column or is like calling or checking data from a new column. Yes? You mentioned in the experimentation part a lot about Facebook and the experiments that they are doing and I've noticed in experimentation lately, there's this long feedback loop recently that people are concerned about the impacts, the long-term impacts on people and some of the ethical and privacy concerns that aren't immediately evident. Is your company giving any thought of how to get some of those risks back to some of the experimentation? Um, if I paraphrase what you might, uh, are you asking about um, if there's concerns that either we or just kind of broad, broadly, um, there should be concerns about people being a part of an experiment, or well, is it some? A, um, I think up until now, the success metrics for an experiment are if people click on it, it's always good. If they don't click on it, it's always a loser, winner versus loser. But now there's some ethical concerns that people are having about, you know, people are getting addicted and they're clicking more and more and more and it's more better and that kind of thing. I'm just wondering if there's any thought being given to how does that feedback in the system? Um, well, I think one of the ways, it, so I, I can't directly talk about the mindset of Facebook, but I do know that it's probably be, because they're dependent on page views and you know traffic daily average users and whatnot um, their main goal is to keep you wanting to come back that's why you see kind of gratuitous push notifications like so and so posted something go you know go see what it was um, but what I do know is some of those experiments and the ethical implications are being taken into considerations, for example, um, there's the screen time within Apple, there's um, nighttime mode on most of these phones now. I think um, the new OnePlus just introduced a Zen mode, um, which 
takes like 30 minutes. It disables the phone, like literally, I think you can maybe call emergency numbers and that's it. All of those were done by some form of experimentation and saying, hey, if we don't do this, um, users are going to either get burnt out, there's gonna be an industry backlash. How can we do, like, you know, take the high road and be the most pragmatic um, people but while still not ruining our core fundamentals and our metrics within a company, but also provide a little bit more of a way to detach. And I'm near certain that the way they would have done some of those things, um, the altruistic side of tech, uh, you know, would it, I say that kind of jokingly, but they probably did some of that, collected some of that data through experiments and said, if we give it, if it's 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes, which one's most effective? Um, if your screen time pops up like this or we make it more annoying, how likely or unlikely are you to do something? So I can't speak directly on the Facebook part exactly, although um, I'm sure they're gonna run a ton of experiments now with the recent announcement on um, you know, making groups and privacy more user centric and less about like the broad, uh, or the broader news feed and focus on that. So. Can you see optimizing maybe incentivizing some sort of something that identifies as an ethical experiment, maybe uh, saying we'll, we'll charge less or something like that, and we're contributing to the ethical. Um, I don't know about that. I, I don't know about that particular part. But for nonprofits, we um, we provide it for nearly free for any nonprofit. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks so much.